say the three of them. Um, each will have a central speaker. Um, our first speaker is Professor James Medicar. Unfortunately, he can't be with us in person, but can't speak technology. He is available um, by Skype, I believe. Um, so, James Medicar, he holds a Canada Research Chair in Governance for Sustainable Development. He's a professor in the School of Public. Policy and Administration in the Department of Political Science at Carlton University. And his research focuses on the both the structures and processes of governance to promote transitions towards sustainability. And he's written widely on governance for sustainable development, environmental politics, and uh, policy, and on energy and, and climate policy, including recent works on carbon capture and storage, smart grids, the development of Ontario system, the politics of socio-technical transitions, and negative carbon emissions. They want me not to be too long on their bias, but anyway. Okay, uh, the, the second speaker is uh, um, Dana Olsen. I'm oh, sorry, we have Eva Lachman. She is Associate Professor of the Department of Systematic Studies at Lincoln University of Art and Art, Sweden. Um, <laughs> sorry. Speech. The research is placed within an interpretive research tradition and located at the interface of political science, environmental studies, and science and technology studies. Much of her work is focused on the ideas, knowledge, claims, and expert practices that inform environmental politics and government. Climate change is her prime and critical example, but in recent years she has also explored how the Anthropocene is figured and narrated as a political problem. Since the late 2015, she has been the convener of the Earth System Governance Project Sub Task Force on the Anthropocene, together with Professor Frank Beerman. And her work has been extensively published in journals such as the School of Environmental Politics, Science, Technology, and Human Values, Science, with Science for School Policy Studies, Review for International Relations, and Global Environment and Change. She's also co author of the Volumes of Environmental Politics and the Democracy, Exploring the Promise of New Modes of Governance, uh, 2010, and Research Handbook, Handbook on Climate Governance, 2015. And she is also an editorial member of the journals of uh, Global Environmental Politics, Critical Policy Studies, and the Anthropocene. And our last speaker is um, Professor Leonard Oxen. He is a professor of geography at Newton University and the founding director of the Newton University Center for Sustainable Studies, Sustainability Studies, as well as the coordinator of uh, the LUCIB, the Linnaeus Center. And his research fields include human nature interactions in the context of land degradation, climate change, and food security sovereignty in Africa and globally. His current research focuses on the politics of climate change in the context of poverty, food security, and ill health in sub Saharan Africa and beyond. He's had research positions in Australia, so welcome home, <laughs> uh, in the United States, Hong Kong, and participated in several international assignments, including. Assessments. More recently, he was coordinating the reporter with a chapter on livelihoods and poverty. That was chapter 13 in the FCC's uh, fifth assessment report, uh, will be group two. Um, in terms of the system governance project, he is a member of the scientific steering group and a coordinator of the sub task force on resilience. So we have a great panel who um, they're obviously very well equipped to. to um, to discuss the issues of the conceptual foundations of the system of governance. And first, we will have Professor Medicroft, followed by um, Eva and Leonard. And then each, each will have 20 minutes to speak. I will put an alarm on here, which is sufficiently scandalous because I really don't know what to <laughs> and, uh, and then we will open the floor for discussion and comments after that. So, first, we will um, we pass it on to James. <coughs> Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah, good. Yeah, good. Great. Yeah. Hi, um, so I'm very pleased to be here. I'm sorry I'm not with you in person. I was looking forward to it, but unfortunately uh, we had a bit of a family emergency, so I wasn't able to travel. 
So um, what I'm going to talk, the title of my paper is the same as the title of the semi plenary and I'm going to give, I guess, a little bit of an introduction on um, how I see the question of conceptual foundations and conceptual change in environmental policy. And um, uh, then I think, and also talk a little bit about our task force, and then I think the two other speakers will give kind of more substantive analysis of uh, particular concepts in the environmental policy area. So, right, there we go. Okay, so this is uh, an outline of my talk, uh, three points, <coughs> concepts and conceptual change, the evolution of environmental concepts, and then I'll talk a little bit, as I said, about the, the uh, task force. So starting with concepts and conceptual change. Um, basically, the, 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 the idea I'm starting with is the idea of concepts as plot categories. Um, so a little bit on words and concepts. Concepts are not words. Concepts are more like the ideas that lurk behind words. And you can see this clearly because um, we can have several words that denote a single concept. So that's the idea of liberty, for instance, or freedom. Both are generally taken to refer to the same sort of thing. Um, and also we can have the opposite, where one word denotes several concepts. So that's the idea of, if you think about state, in English it can be, state can be a condition, uh, and it can also be uh, a political unit. Um, so concepts are critical because they are the way in which we think about the world, see the world, and to some extent, they also constitute uh, the social world. Because these categories are the categories which are translated, through which we actually act in the world. And obviously, concepts both enable us, they can allow us to think new things, uh, but they can also constrain us because thinking about things in one way may preclude thinking about it in another. Um, concepts, if you like, are part of a web. Uh, to define any concept, you have to use other concepts, and they are the building blocks of arguments, discourses, and ideologies, which can often use, may use different concepts, but can even use the same concept, but use it in different ways. Um, we had a little reference to this in the early panel, the question of ambiguity and precision. On one hand, we want to be clear, and we think that clear concepts are good concepts. But it's also true that in political and social arguments, ambiguity uh, can be critical to making a concept useful um, and enabling it to be engaged with by many different uh, audiences. Contestation, because concepts themselves may be internally complex, and by rearranging the components in different ways, they can have different bearing with, and this is the final thing, critical implications for um, practice. Um, there's lots of evidence that shows that changes in the categories that we use to think about the world are closely related to political. Uh, and social change, because in order to do new things, we order, we need to be able to think new things, and the doing uh, and the thinking are interde interdependent. So if we turn to the evolution of concepts in the environmental policy domain, um, first and most obvious thing is that there's been a continuous development, expansion of the range of these concepts, um, over the half century since the environment, uh, modern environmental governance was born kind of in the second half of the 1960s and the early 1970s. Um, these are just a few examples, sustainable development, biodiversity, critical loads, adaptive management, environmental security, planetary boundaries. All these are new thought objects that have been used to try and understand the interaction between humans and the natural world, and have been used to frame uh, uh, environmental policy arguments. Um, in order to kind of reinforce this thing, I'd like to tell a little bit the story of, I put it, call it here, the story of the environment, but really I mean the story of the concept of the environment. 
Um, today, the environment is so pervasive. Uh, it's in politics, it's in school, uh, in school lessons, uh, it's in universities, it's in all aspects of our life. But the fact is that the, in, there was a time when the environment uh, was a new concept. If you go back into the word environment has been used in the English language since the middle of the 19th century. But it, and its basic core meaning has been the idea of surroundings, that which surrounds. Um, and it penetrated deeply into science uh, and was used uh, in natural science, but also in engineering and cybernetics in different sorts of contexts to meet that which surrounded the system that surrounded it, an individual or a specific entity. But the use that uh, we think of it today really only grew up in the early 1960s um, when the environment came to mean something more specific. It's the environment and the surroundings, particularly the natural surroundings around mankind. More specifically, the surroundings in which our societies depend for sustenance, but which we, by our action, are beginning to put in danger. So you get this notion of the threatened environment. Um, it's very interesting because if you look at some of pioneering texts in the environmental movement, um, I'm thinking, for instance, of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, um, which we all know is kind of a pillar of uh, the development of the environment movement. Actually, the word environment appears something like eight or nine times in the entire book. Um, mostly, Rachel Carson talks about nature and various other categories. She, when she does use it, it's in critical passages summing up the argument. And it's almost always used with some words that make more clear what she means by the environment. So it says things like the total environment surrounding mankind, or the environment within which mankind lives, and things like that. By the time you get to um, the Rio Earth Summit in um, 19, 1992, the environment is just used, the environment as totally taken for granted, as if we all know what it means. And in fact, it is this modern version of kind of um, uh, the threatened environment. So, okay, so this is a change in words, but it's very interesting to see how this change in concepts is closely associated with the change in practice. So it's almost at the same time, in the late, kind of from about 1967 on, in the next five years, all the OECDs set up environmental ministries, environmental agencies, environmental experts, scientific consulting groups, and so on. Well, why? It makes sense to govern the environment once there is this vulnerable nature that humor and humans is damaging. So it's as you summon the category into existence, it makes sense to start then to speak about environmental governance, environmental protection in the first instance, and ministries and agencies to protect the environment. It's also interesting to see that the environment helped unite many disparate movements. Um, that were dealing with uh, pollution control or nature protection that previously had been isolated or seen as a part. Now, if you were campaigning to stop dumping in a local watercourse or protect a local woodland, you weren't just engaging in some parochial activity. You were part of a broader endeavor to protect the environment. So it's interesting how the change in concept is closely linked in the change in actual political practice. And I submit that this is true with many of the other, most of the other concepts that are in the environmental realm. And we can see this link between the change in behavior and action that becomes possible, that's enabled, that's intertwined with the conceptual innovation. Um, that just kind of fills in what I was talking about. Um, I guess the, the one point there I didn't mention about was what allowed it to catch on. Um, and the thing is that there are a number of features about the environment, the concept of the environment, that particularly enabled it to catch on. So it had a high scientific pedigree. It had been used in um, science since the end of the 19th century, where people were talking about specific environments, like the environment of the coral reef or the environment of the polar bear. 
Um, it was widely used in general language. Um, it has the potential to uh, refer to a huge number of um, uh, phenomena. It's scalable. You can talk about the local environment or the global environment. Um, it's ambiguity. It's open textured and can be applied to everything from the built environment to the natural environment. And it has a clear anthrop anthropic resonance. It's our environment. And indeed, the first usages that you see, I mentioned Rachel Carson, but it's also true in the Stockholm Conference uh, uh, in the early 1970s, which was about the human environment. Um, it's clear that it's not some abstract nature, but it's nature as it surrounds us and as it sustains us. So all of those things help environment become this, rather than a number of rival terms like ecology, which was already existed, and indeed was taken by some groups uh, kind of to be this broad frame of concept. Okay, so concepts have histories. I've just given a kind of potted history of the environment, or at least the beginning of it. Um, and concepts also rise and fall. They gain prominence. Um, they can fall out of interest. Uh, one interesting case there is the concept of nuisance. If you look at a lot of early environmental law in the 1960s and 70s, even in OECD publications, you will find very often the discussion is the protection of the environment and the prevention of nuisance. Um, nuisance was an eye. This was linked, of course, to earlier common law traditions, and it's now you don't see nuisance very often in relation to the environment. Um, I mentioned the rise and fall of concepts. So these are just a couple of uh, illustrations. Um, so this is these uh, bar charts, and I apologize if it's hard to see, but I will talk you through it. Um, this tracks the appearance of some, some selected concepts in the seven European Environmental Action Programs from 1973 to 2013. So what we did was look how often these concepts um, appear. Um, and um, there are four concepts that are tracked. Uh, the first one here is uh, the blue is the polluted place principle. There's recycling, environmental assessment, uh, and decoupling. And you can see how some of these concepts have uh, like, So recycling is basically once it comes, comes on stream in the early 70s, is there uh, more or less uh, consistent. Um, a contrast is the idea of uh, the concept of decoupling, which is a concept that really hasn't caught on. This is decoupling economic growth from environmental impact. You can see it uh, had, was quite prominent in 2002. Uh, that was because the OECD tried to make it one of the pivotal ideas in its environmental strategy for the new millennium. Um, it still appears in the uh, 2013 E, but it hasn't really caught on. And there are all sorts of reasons why this concept um, doesn't really fly. It's complex, it's hard to understand, and the politicians are very nervous, and it's very hard to show that we're actually making progress in decoupling environmental impacts uh, from economic growth, particularly in some of the sticky topics like uh, climate change. Um, I'm just trying to, I lost a slide there. Well, it doesn't matter. Um, I had another slide in here which tracked um, uh, four other concepts, one of which was pollution. Um, and uh, I'll just mention it because it starts out high and declines over time. So in 1973, pollution is the only uh, one of the concepts that we track that is really prominent in the, in the environmental impact, uh, European Environmental Action Program. Um, but over time, it becomes relatively less important. That's not because there's less pollution, but rather pollution has been completely integrated into systems of control and the environmental policy framework. And other issues have become more prominent uh, and subject to, uh, to, more, to more debate. Um, policy and political concepts. Um, the point I really want to make here is that lots of concepts are useful in political argument, but only a certain number manage to penetrate into what we could call the policy world. Um, 
I mean, a good example I used this uh, in the earlier panel was the idea of degrowth, which is an interesting concept, hot topic among academics, hasn't pe penetrated that far into environmental ministries um, for obvious reasons, because of its relative clashing with uh, dominant conceptualizations, frameworks of power and institutions. Um, the last thing I want to mention in this context is changes in the policy field. So if you Jesus. look at the constellation of concepts that people are using to talk about environmental policies um, over the decades, they evolve uh, considerably. So in the 1970s, for instance, <laughs> yep, I see. <laughs> in the 1970s, uh, for instance, um, meta concepts were uh, the environment, um, by the um, and manic, which we call environmental management concepts, um, were, were things like the polluter pays principle and so on, um, uh, cost effective environmental regulation. Uh, by the time you get to the 1990s. Sustainability and sustainable development have joined environment as a, as a meta concept, and management co concepts include things like the three pillars of sustainability, balancing economy, environment, and society, environmental policy integration, the precautionary principle, environmental risk management, integrated pollution control, critical loads, and so on. Um, by the time that you get um, uh, to the 2010s, uh, and, and you have uh, further concepts, uh, for instance, that are used as environmental management concepts, such as the concept of resilience, and you begin to get ideas like planetary boundaries and these sorts of ideas that are beginning to be uh, brought into the policy debate. So there's a steady evolution um, and uh, a change in these configurations. Oops. Oh, there was my missing slide. <laughs> so you can just see that uh, pollution starts out, it absolutely dominates environmental action plans through to the 80s. Sustainable development begins to come online from the early 90s, and climate change and, bio and biodiversity also from uh, 1992 after the Rio Earth Summit. Um, so the last thing I'd like to briefly talk about is this thing that we have that's called a task force, for those of you who may not be familiar. Task force is a bit of a funny name because really it's a research network, we're not some small group with a big budget. We're uh, quite a lot of people but with not a big budget. But we're networks of researchers who are looking at the conceptual foundations of Earth system governance. So here are the major goals of the task force, which really are to develop a critical understanding of novel ideas which are being introduced into Earth Systems Governance and managing global environmental problems, accelerate the development of new ideas and approaches, and build research capacity analysis and innovation, particularly by encouraging collaboration between young stage and older researchers, people in the North and the South, and academics and practitioners. Um, the kind of critical goals that we have vis-a-vis -vis these concepts um, are uh, really to analyze their character, origin, and development. Where did they come from? Um, to look at their uptake, influence, and practice. Who is promoting these concepts? How do they affect different groups? Uh, how do interests uh, relate to this? What practices have they been linked to? What are the results of those practices? Tensions, cleavages, and contradictions. Um, and ultimately, then, the significance and potential of these concepts, and are there changes and modifications that can be done to make them more useful to the, uh, to the general problem of managing global environmental problems. Um, so these are concepts like I mentioned. Some of them, Earth Systems Governance itself needs to be subject to critical interrogation, the Anthropocene, planetary boundaries, resilience, sustainability science, the green economy, uh, and many more. Um, so at the moment, we have active research uh, working groups on these concepts here, environmental policy integration, resilience, the Anthropocene, ecological and green democracy, environmental security,
transitions and transformations, sustainable entity science. But this is not understood as a kind of closed list. So we like to invite you to join us in working on some of these and join one of these uh, networks, working on these or other ideas. Uh, so that's the website, and thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much, James. Well within your time, so much appreciated. Um, well, we now have Eva as the second speaker. Is it working? Yes, very good. <coughs> Is it just here that it's loaded? Here we go. Good. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm uh, very happy to introduce the Anthropocene uh, task force, or rather my interpretation of what our task is. And then I look forward to, to uh, the, the conversations that we will have after, after this. Uh, so I've entitled my talk, The Anthropocene, A Story with Many Endings. And this is precisely to illustrate the multiple ways in which the Anthropocene has been engaged with in recent years. Uh, so rather than, than sort of accepting the diagnosis of the Anthropocene as an empirical fact, which I think many of our natural science peers would like us to, uh, I will here propose, and in line with, with what James just has outlined, that we more think about it as an idea, as a figure, as a thought category in, in James' terms, that now is traveling across scholarly domains at very rapid speed, actually, and that it's reworked, rethought, reconfigured as it meets various analytical ends. Um, so it's in that spirit that I will propose three possible ways in which this, this concept, this notion, has been talked about and, and figured. Uh, so I will introduce three possible endings here. Uh, uh, and uh, with that as a backdrop, I will then make a case where I think it's time for the environmental politics and earth system governance sort of scholarships to put this figure to analytical use um, and critically explore, explore how it may bring new meanings and energy to our scholarly pursuits. And this is where I see that the, the task force may form as a function as a platform or as, as a catalyst, if you will. Okay. The end of nature. Uh, this first sort of figuration or ending, if you will, uh, is one that I think most of you are very familiar with. Uh, this idea that nature as we know it is coming to an end as a result of human intervention and environmental degradation has a long history in the Global Environmental Change Scholarship <coughs> to which we belong here. And uh, today it's frequently reproduced in public discourse. I'm sure that most of you have seen, seen the cover page of... Um, the Economist, this is from May 2011, and this is really uh, uh, the event that popularized the, the term the Anthropocene and, and this notion that humans have become a force of nature that is reshaping the planet on a geological scale. Uh, the idea had been floating around for some time before the Economist picked it up. Um, Actually, the first time that the concept was used and, and uh, given this particular meaning uh, was in a global change newsletter published by the International Geosphere Biosphere Programme in year 2000. Uh, here is a little piece, a very brief piece actually, but now famous, very famous and, and, and frequently quoted uh, by Paul Crutzen and Eugene Stormer. And here they suggest that the expansion of mankind, both in numbers and per capita e exploitation of the Earth's resources, has been astounding. It seems to us more than appropriate to emphasize the central role of mankind in geology and ecology by proposing to use the term the Anthropocene for the current geological epoch. Now, they were obviously building upon a long tradition of, of, of research when they, they proposed this, uh, this concept. So uh, this notion that we have entered into a new epoch in the history of, of Earth uh, had been, been around for some time in the Global Environmental Change Scholarship, and it rests 
experts upon uh, a broad range of empirical observations, modeling studies, many of which have been coordinated by the IGVP and, and the Earth System Science Scholarship. But we shouldn't underestimate this effort of giving it a name. This is when it was given a particular name, and since then, this Anthropocene concept has been widely picked up in, in the Global Environmental Change Scholarship uh, and, and beyond. Um, perhaps you've seen these graphs that often are used to demonstrate uh, um, the um, Anthropocene. Now, in, we know that geologists are still debating whether we can actually talk about the Anthropocene as a geological epoch, and if so, when it began. But many environmental scholars have already accepted the Anthropocene as an empirical fact uh, and uh, are in the process of sort of identifying its characteristics, its history, and its future tra 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 trajectories. And um, this paper by uh, Will Stephan, Kurtzen, and McNeil uh, suggests that the Anthropocene began in the 1800s and is closely associated to the industrial sort of expansion of fossil fuel use. Uh, and as famously outlined by this this graph here, they suggest that we entered into the second stage of the Anthropocene in the 1950s, when the human enterprise switched gear, they say, as a result of the expanding world economy. And we here see sort of an exponential growth of human sort of environmental degradation and uh, resource use. So we entered into the great acceleration. But there are others who still suggest that we may be remain in the Holocene. Uh, James referred to this paper uh, previously, the famous nature paper by Johan Rockström and colleagues. Uh, and here they actually suggest that we can still avoid entering into this dangerous and unpredictable era of the, of the Anthropocene by staying within the planetary or the boundaries of the planet. So if we do not move out of this green sort of area, we may still operate in the Holocene, but if, as we sort of uh, move beyond these planetary boundaries, we're entering into unknown terrain, the Anthropocene. Now, taken together, uh, these sort of science accounts of the Anthropocene converge around an empirical story of environmental decline and catastrophism, which I, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. Um, in the Anthropocene, natural systems are so altered by human activities that they no longer can be considered natural. So we may face the end of nature as we know it. And this end of nature stories has a number of traits. First, it stipulates that the Anthropocene is characterized by unpredictability and danger. Human resource exploitation and land transformation and pollution now cascade through the Earth system in complex, unpredictable and dangerous ways we've learned. This Anthropocene figure is also surrounded by great alarm and urgency. Global change is now beyond the range of natural variability. The Earth is now operating in a non-analog state. Uh, the end of, of nature's story is also a very managerial one. Nature's ending is framed as a planetary emergency, but it can still be reversed or controlled through responsible Earth system stewardship. And in this uh, literature and debate, uh, there are many proposals for how we, we can sort of act as planetary stewards. Uh, Kurtzen and Stormer put great hope to the global research community here and, and engineering community to guide mankind towards global sustainable environmental management. More recently uh, there are other proposals for planetary stewardship in, in the State of the Planet Declaration from the London Planet Under Pressure Conference. We learned that nation states can become planetary stewards by enacting global sustainable, sustainable development goals. Um, but this is just one way in which the Anthropocene concept has gained ground and sort of been given meaning. It's also been stipulated as the end of politics. And, and this second ending has to do with, with, it sort of emerges from an eco-socialist narrative that has gained ground in recent years that emphasizes the social, political and ideological origins effects of contemporary environmental problems. And at the core of this account is a critique of what is seen as a deeper politicized science story of the Anthropocene. And uh, the Anthropocene is here 
presented as a post-political figure that pits a disembodied and generalized humanity against the great, great forces of nature. Um, and yet the argument is that the elevation of the environment to a universal global concern conceals strategic relations of power and inequality and paves the way for techno-managerial planning. Um, now, I don't know if you've heard Eric Swingedo talk about the Anthropocene, but he's certainly one of the, those very articulate voices in this debate. Uh, and uh, he has suggested that the science story of the Anthropocene rests, rests upon and nurtures ecologies of fear. Environmental problems are staged universally threatening the survival of humankind and announcing the premature termination of civilization as we know it. The scripting of nature permits and sustains a post-political arrangement suttered by fear and driven by a concern to manage things so that we can hold on to what we have. And this is what he means with the post-political here. Uh, he also continues, a strictly populist post-politics emerges here, one that elevates the interest of an imaginary, the people, nature, or the environment to the level of the universal, rather than open up, opening up spaces that permits us to universalize the claims of particular socio-natures, environments, or social groups or classes. The enemy in this story is always vague, ambiguous, socially unnamed, and politically uncounted, and ultimately empty. And here, that, if we read between the lines, Eric Swingedo, of, of course, means that the enemy is the current social political arrangement that we have, neoliberal capitalism. And the argument here is that politics is naturalized within a given socio-ecological order for which there is no real alternative. Uh, this is a very different story of the Anthropocene than the first one. Uh, it's uh, been articulated by others as well. Uh, some of you know Alf Hornboy. He's also one of, a political ecologist who's made it an intervention into to this debate and certainly asked social scientists to resist and disrupt the, the natural science framing of the Anthropocene. So instead of elevating the Anthropocene to a global and shared concern of humankind, humankind as a biological species, which is the science framing, he argues, he wants us to approach it as an inherently social predicament that can be decomposed and altered through political analysis and activism. And here is a quote where he suggests that to challenge the species centrism of the Anthropocene narrative is to make two important points often disregarded by natural scientists. First, the incentives, benefits, and negative repercussions of, of industrialism are very unevenly distributed among social categories within the human species. So we can't just talk about the Anthropocene as, as sort of an era where humanity as a whole is facing a shared threat, but we need to sort of uh, address the, the inequalities uh, that sort of underpin uh, this current era. And then secondly, and this is of course very important for social scientists, there is nothing biologically inevitable about the institutions and forms of social organization that we now know as capitalism. The Anthropocene is not inevitable, we can change it. It's a social uh, configuration that is, that is something that we have constructed and therefore it's open to change. Uh, and he actually suggests that we need to socialize the Anthropocene by giving it a different name. So he has proposed the Technocene as a better description of the, the era we live in. Uh, along those lines, there are now innovations here around the Anthropocene concept. Jason Moore has in a recent paper suggested that we should instead talk about the Capitalocene. Uh, which is a better description of the era which we live in. He suggests here, are we really living in the Anthropocene with its return to curiously Eurocentric vista of humanity and its reliance on well-worn notions of resource and technological determinism? Or are we living in the Capitalocene, the historical era shaped by relations privileging the endless accumulation of capital? Of course, this is very provocative, but also offers a different story of what the Anthropocene is all about and also opens up the debate and, and sort of opens up for conceptual innovation here, I think. Um, here we see that the concept has traveled and taken on new meanings and in different scholarly communities. The final ending that I would like to address is, has a very different origin uh, and it's articulated and explored within uh, a growing field of environmental humanities. Uh, 
and I don't know to what extent you're familiar with this literature, but it's, it's a scholarship found at the intersection, I guess, of environmental studies, cultural studies, critical animal studies, feminist technoscience, uh, some call them neo-materialist studies. Um, and these analytical schools converge around a critique of the human-centered ontology of Western environmental science, politics, and ethics. And here, the modern figure of the autonomous, self-sufficient human subject is approached as the very root cause of the contemporary environmental crisis. So this very idea that humanity, humanity can elevate itself from its natural sort of bounds has created this full separation between nature and society, the human and the non-human world, body and mind, object and subject. Uh, some scholars in this field have warned that the Anthropocene idea might actually sort of uh, evoke the same human ontology that, that sustains this separation, uh, but others have actually played around with the concept and approached it as an inv invitation to resituate the human, but also the humanities, uh, within nature and cultivate new ethical relations with a more than human world, which they call it. So everything that is not human. Uh, and here, the Anthropocene has taken on a completely different meaning uh, to the previous. Um, in a recent publication or a, a little book uh, called Manifesto for Living in the Anthropocene, which is uh, co-authored by, by environmental philosophers such as Deborah Bird Rose, Catherine Gibson, and others. Okay. The Anthropocene uh, comes about as a story of human and environmental intermingling and entanglement. Um, that may resituate the human in ecological terms, this argument to overcome this modern idea that human is outside nature. And we may, by using, thinking about the Anthropocene and working with the Anthropocene concept, learn to be affected by the body world that we're part of. But the concept may also help us to resituate the non-human in ethical terms. To, so to overcome the modern idea that the non-human world is devoid of meaning and value and look for new ways of living for Earth others. And this is a, now an expanding field of scholarship, which is very interesting uh, to explore. And I won't have time to give you uh, all the examples I had here, but uh, there are those who really try to sort of uh, explore now how the human and the non-human interact in all sorts of bodily practices. And this is a sort of tradition that comes from feminist uh, techno-science. Uh, Donna Haraway is one, one of the central figures in the, this literature, but it's certainly plays around with the Anthropocene concept in, in very new ways. Uh, and there are others who have also used uh, this tradition to sort of problematize this notion of nature that has been so central to, to Western environmental thought, policy, politics and action, uh, mm. and to, to suggest that we may have to rethink what nature really is and how it interacts with the social, and that we now live in a hybrid world where we can't separate nature and, and society. Uh, as we have previously. Um, a book that also is interesting in the context of this scholarship uh, is Living Through the End of Nature by uh, Paul Wapner, uh, where he also invites us to rethink what environmental politics can be in this hybrid era, when we can't make a clear distinction between what is natural and what is human. Uh, so certainly, the Anthropocene concept is now circulating in all sorts of uh, domains, contacts, and, 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 and scholarly pursuits. And I think this is where I would like to sort of uh, see, the, see the task force for the conversations that we have here. Uh, uh, well, I think certainly that we need to sort of move away from the interpretation of the Anthropocene as an empirical fact and think instead of it as a, an opportunity, a possibility to play around with new ways of, of, of uh, sort of defining our scholarly pursuits. And I think it certainly is the beginning of a lively and important interdiscipl interdisciplinary debate on the environment. As an idea, as a figure, the Anthropocene give, gives rise to multiple political projects and trajectories, and is already doing a lot of innovative work across scholarly domains. And perhaps I don't know, but perhaps this could be the beginning of a new generation of environmental politics scholarship. I, I certainly think that the Anthropocene concept is such a playful one that it may invite us to enliven political and moral imagination, to explore more hopeful ecological narratives, to experiment with multiple green futures, and to repoliticize the environment. Uh, and this is my last slide. So 
here are just a number of questions that this task force may want to explore, to work with. There are many more that I think could be potent for, for further analysis. But certainly, uh, I would like uh, to end by suggesting uh, that by thinking about these concepts as ideas, as figures, as thought categories, we may bring them to life and, and make them into our own, rather than accepting them as, as given by, by our natural science peers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first, I would like to um, stress that in the task force on resilience, we've had a number of webinars. We have a really nice uh, group. It's fairly small, 20, 25 people. Some of you are here. We cover the whole spectrum from um, very important resilience theorists like uh, Lance Gunderson and Brian Walker from this very university to the uh, sort of hardcore Foucauldian critics like Julian Reed. So it's a, it's a span enormously. But what I will present here is pure my own take on resilience. So so um, if you feel uncomfortable with this, uh, I stress that I'm not referring to anybody else work than myself. Okay, um, where do I press um, this one? Well, I, I, I can use this one. That's easy. Okay. Can use this okay. One. First, I will um, run through a great number of pictures very, very quickly. So, fasten your seatbelts. I'll try to, to show what is sort of how widespread is the use of, of resilience. We can talk about the resilience individual, the resilient pupil, uh, the resilient student, the resilient classroom, the resilient professional, the resilient organization, the resilient business. The resilient sports people, um, uh, local resilience forum for, for um, uh, government. We can have public health should be resilient. Uh, 2008, there is still a huge amount of resilience in the consumer side of the economy. Lance Armstrong can teach us something about resilience, apparently. <laughs> uh, you can build in career resilience. Uh, if your skin is a problem, you can make it more resilient by using this cream. And if your house has a problem, you can use this paint and you become resilient. And the latest wave of resilience is actually in military. So I suppose we will have a resilient war was in the very uh, near future. And this is sort of uh, what, so how, how the uh, American Defense Force is sort of teaching resilience. Uh, I don't know how to categorize this uh, <laughs> resilience knife view. All roads lead to resilience. Yes. So, confused? <laughs> yes. So, the idea is to try to, to reduce this, this confu confusion. Um, first question, why is it so successful? A concept that is taken up by private businesses, NGOs, big uh, international organizations like World Bank, um, UNEP and so forth, environmentalists, scientists, politicians, everybody seems to use it. There must be something in this concept that makes it so extremely popular. Um, I don't claim to have the answer, but I think that in this excellent paper by Jeremy Walker and Melinda Cooper, um, I think they have something really important. In essence, it boils down to that, that resilience speaks to the zeitgeist so well. And in essence, it's Hayek plus Holling equals true. So the philosophies of these two thinkers, Hayek as the main uh, theorist behind the free market economy, um, and Holling, the one who, who, uh, who, who made resilience, uh, sort of created resilience theory in ecology and, and facilitated sort of the move of resilience concept out of economy to a wider environmental field. And this is a perfect match. We also uh, say that they probably never met. They probably never ever uh, read uh, each other's papers. But there is some kind of attractiveness that makes this combination so uh, extremely popular. It's probably not the whole story, but I think there is something important in it. Um, so, Hayek, that's sort of neoliberalism. Um, and 
just neoliberalism is something, a concept that is often very, is used by many people, sometimes is misused, uh, according to some at least. Um, so, so I would just very quickly say what, what I mean, and it's uh, the, the meaning very much taken from uh, geographers like uh, David Harvey, uh, Jamie Peck, or, or um, the last example is from Louis Vacan, uh, so, so, so it's, it's the neoclassical economics plus liberalism, the political idea of liberalism plus the economics, uh, neo neoclassical economics, which is sort of, um, a free market is the best principle for allocating resources. Um, and it's important to say that there is no neoliberal state. It is a process. It's, ut it's, a, it's a utopia. It is a process. Um, and it builds upon the redistribution of costs, not benefits. Um, and it's shifting responsibilities down, mainly sort of from state to citizens. We're not supposed to have... Uh, the state is not supposed to care for our health and our education and so forth, but we are supposed to do that our, ourselves. The responsibilities are shifted downwards to citizens. And shifting uh, responsibilities are shifted out from the state to the private. Um, it's pro-cyclical compared to Keynesian economic that was anti-cyclical. The idea of the Keynesian economy was to, to predict when we have sort of a uh, recessions and try to use public resources in order to, 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 to mitigate the social implications of, of, of these sort of recessions. So it's a complete break with that. It's procyclical. That means that when there is a crisis, that is an important moment for redistributing wealth. And the ultimate example is um, when, uh, when municipalities and cities go bankrupt, for example. That's the ultimate redistribution of public assets. Uh, Detroit, for example, went bankrupt recently, and these moments are extremely effective redistribution of public assets. Um, and it's hegemonic, which means that language is extremely important. And this last point, I think, language, resilience fits so nicely with. If we make everybody resilient, then they will easier handle, uh, sort of um, care for, 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 for themselves. Um, Louis Vacant says the invisible hand of the market and the iron fist of the state combine and complement each other in a very nice way. He tries to use this in a, um, to, to explain why the prisons are filled with poor people while we have an extremely laissez-faire system at the top. So we have a laissez-faire system for, for rich and affluent groups and we have an extremely um, um, repressive system for poor people. So this is the kind of of, of um, political process or trend that resilience fits into very nicely. I think it's captured also quite nicely by, by Julian Reed and Brad Evans um, in, in, in the book Resilient Life, The Art of Living Dangerously. Dangerously exposed, the life and death of the resilient subject. So if you pre present the world as dangerous, of course, the, the, um, um, the obvious response is to teach people how to live in a dangerous world, and then they will cope with this easier. Um, what does the concept mean? Uh, in a recent paper that we published, um, um, Henrik, myself, and, and, and some others, <laughs> uh, we, we try to uh, get some, not uh, find sort of the pre precise definitions, but try to categorize or make a typology of the different meanings of it. Um, and so here we have, we, we, uh, we say that uh, we have two different meanings of resilience and there are two different attributes forming a sort of typical four field uh, diagram. So you can have the bounce back meaning and you can have it that it could be descriptive, which neutral is neither bad nor good. Or it could be prescriptive, namely good. We didn't find any, any examples where it's prescriptive bad. And you can have bounce back and transform, and it can be descriptive, very sort of neutral, and it could also be a good thing. So, and here we have uh, uh, some uh, typical publications that sort of illustrate these kinds. So, so four types of, of, of meanings. I think this can be quite useful 
uh, when we try to sort of understand what is actually meant by building resilience or, or, or something like that. Um, and then next question, why is this unappealing to social science? Because we think it is unappealing to social science. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the, 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 the publication where more um, uh, information is provided. So we started with a bibliographic or bibliometric analysis. And we took sort of the 10 highest ranked journals in various fields like economics, political science, sociology, anthropology, and so forth. And we took 10 years of papers and looked to what extent they are using these terms. And we find an enormous concentration in geography, environmental studies, and ecology. And almost nothing in anthropology, sociology, political science, and economics. So that's our claim that it hasn't, it's not used by the core of the social sciences. If we define the core of the social science as the 10 highest ranked journals. It might be a bit crude, but, but it was uh, s uh, striking how, how concentrated it was. And it was even more concentrating, concentrated when you look at the, the journals. Two journals stand for something like 80-85% of all, all of the papers on this. And it's Ecology and Society and Global Environmental Change. And importantly, Global Environmental Change has a long history. And in 2006, they got the new editor-in-chief who, have, who was one of the core members of the Resilience Alliance, and that was when they started to, 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 to publish in, in this field, and has continued so far. So, so we see that it's, um, it's not only a concept that is, it travels by its, its own properties, it's, it's supported by, uh, you can say, uh, a very effective um, group. So in this paper, we also try to say, why isn't this appealing to social sciences? And we find five main reasons. It might be difficult to, to read. I will concentrate on just two of them. So the first one is systems ontology. Resilience, as I think Henrik says, it, can, it must refer to a system. We can't just say we have a resilient day today. It must refer to some kind of a system. And that is usually absolutely unproblematic in the natural sciences because we can have systems as ontological description. But it becomes more problematic whenever humans are involved. So systems ontology and also system boundaries. We'll talk about more about them later. Uh, concept equilibria, thresholds, feedbacks, very important. That is probably <coughs> the, um, um, the characteristics of resilience that speaks best or more uh, perfectly to the high. That, that's where, where Holling and Hayek sort of meets uh, very best, I think. Uh, also self-organization. Self-organization, equilibrium, pressure, feedbacks. That's sort of where we have a nice fit between sort of the free market philosophy and uh, resilience. And then we have this one, which is perhaps the most <coughs> problematic um, um, part of it. That's the, the functionalism. Uh, I will talk about sort of systems and functionalism now. Uh, when natural scientists use a system ontology, it is usually a kind of ontological description of, of the world. The world is actually composed of anthills. Um, actually, that's where Holling started his study ants in the beginning. Uh, it could be a nitrogen cycle that consists of um, of of, of, of real nitrogen that is circulated um, through the environment or through the e ecological system by, by animals and, and, and plants and, and, and microbes and so forth. Uh, it can be a predator-prey model and usually there are sort of real predators and real prey out, out, out there or it could be energy flow through the ec ec ecosystem. So they are Ontologically, they are quite different from when you're using uh, the term a system in social science. But sometimes this is confused, that the, the, uh, the, the, the ontological description of the world might sometimes be confused if it's, it's transferred to, let's say, um, a community as a system. Um, there are, with this crude diagram, we're trying to illustrate 
the use of system, and particularly system boundary, is very problematic. Because if you want to have a systems ontology, the first thing you need to think about, what is the boundary? What's inside, what's outside that system? And the, we say that there are three sort of fields, academic fields, where resilience has been used for a long time. There is a, a good theoretical underpinning of the use of resilience that is in, in engineering and the system is well defined because we have built it ourselves. It could be a bridge, it could be uh, some, uh, sort of something man-made and it's easy to define what is inside, what is outside. Uh, the oldest actually, um, or, or second oldest, I think engineer might be the, the, the oldest, it goes back to the 19th century, uh, psychology where the system is fairly easily defined as the individual. Talking about the individual, chi uh, the, the, in, the, um, the, the resilient child, for example, is a very strong school in child psychology. And in ecology, and of course, this system is an ecosystem. But then, so when you, when you start to, to um, apply your, your resilience theory uh, on systems that are less easily defined, when you move towards the center, here in the center you have Grand theories, and then in between you have mid-range theories. So grand theory, that might be uh, world system theory, uh, neoclassical economics, and, and classical economics, they're also examples of grand theories. And then we have all these sort of social mid-range theories. So the, the, the more you, you, you um, leave your safe corner of a well-defined system, uh, resilience becomes problematic because we don't really know what it refers to, what kind of system it, 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 it refers to. <coughs> yeah. Uh, the next really problematic area, I think, is um, the reinvention of functionalism. Uh, functionalism or structural functionalism was the dominating, uh, not paradigm perhaps, but, but view in the social sciences, in the... Uh, 50s and 60s, and um, extremely strong. And Talcott Parsons is the sociology is probably the, the best uh, example of it. But it became, it was thrown out almost completely from the social sciences. And somebody actually said, it's, is it dead as a duty? And Talcott Parsons, he had uh, his famous agile heuristic. Uh, four different imperatives that an institution must... must um, sort of um, um, deal with in order to be sustainable or, or, or um, uh, survive. And it fits extremely nicely with the modern ideas in resilience theory. And it's interesting when you read the Panarchy, which is the most important book in resilience uh, literature, they have a definition of social system. And that definition is taken from Talcott Parsons 1953. So, so the, the, the irony here is that resilience was a real fresh theory in ecology. It reacted against the old static view on, of, of sort of balance of nature and so forth. And now when resilience theory is applied to social, the social world, it sort of reinvents an old static theory that was long gone. This is a kind of irony. I think this is the main reason why there is problems for the core of the social sciences to actually um, uh, deal with, with this. I think one of the best examples of functionalist approach uh, uh, to society is this paper in, in, um, in, in Science a few years ago, um, Looming Global Scale Failures and Missing Institutions. It's all about how we create all these missing institutions that are so necessary for avoiding uh, collapse and so forth. Um, so, how to foster more constructive dialogue between natural and social sciences? That's a big question. Um, first of all, I think it's, it's really important to understand what is, if now resilience is so dominating in the ecological sciences, we probably need to, need to understand it better. And uh, when I read this paper by John Park and Edward Hackett, uh, it, it was uh, an important moment. Uh, it's an ethnography, very, very well-researched ethnography of the Resilience Alliance. Uh, they have followed these, uh, this, this uh, uh, exclusive organization for a long time. And um, they described, the, the, the scientists, they described themselves as uh, something 
in between artists and scientists. Um, and when reading much of it, you actually get the impression that it's closer or perhaps in between scientific approach and faith. And I think this is important to understand, and this also tells us something sort of how to, how to respond to it. Um, there is a final um, uh, source of misunderstanding, confusion, I think, between natural scientists and social scientists. This is, uh, has to do how we define uh, things. So Henrik talked about that in a, in a previous uh, session here. And I think uh, he has often used this wonderful example of, if you want, if you, if you make an ostensive definition, uh, it's usually very, they're very uh, efficient, they are simple, they make people understand, uh, but there's a danger. If you want to do, define a whale to somebody who has never seen a whale, you can say that it's a big fish eating plankton. And that worked pretty well. I mean, immediately you have a rough idea what a whale is, isn't it? But it's wrong. Because whales, a whale is not a fish, it's a mammal. But the interesting thing is that this definition, it works pretty well, even though it's wrong. The alternative would be a stipulative definition, which is much more complicated, because you need to, 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 to refer to certain rules, and it would be very almost impossible to explain what a whale is to somebody who's never seen a whale using a stipulative def definition. But sometimes we are, when we take definitions across natural and social sciences, we don't really know whether it's an ostensive or a stipulative definition. That's one source of confusion or miscommunication. And then finally, I think there is a, the problem, uh, a key problem is that uh, how we understand what society is. Uh, in sociology, you, you sometimes talk about the two big families of theories. Consensus theories or conflict theories. According to consensus, consensus theories, we think that society evolves, develops through negotiation, understanding, and then gradually we, we see an, a betterment of society through rational arguments and, and negotiation. The other family, conflict theory, said, no, I mean, it's society evolves through conflicting, clashing values and power, uh, asymmetries and so forth. And it's quite clear that most of the natural scientists who are interested in society, they have a consensus idea of society. If we just provide this information, there's some kind of rational taking up of these ideas and the problems will be solved. And I think this is, uh, while most social scientists, I would say, uh, are probably more oriented towards conflict theories. Um, how many minutes do I have? No, okay. <laughs> so then I will just say, keep going. You can do this. Resilience is about understanding that difficult times will pass when you know ways to solve your problems and seek help. You will feel happy again if you are resilient. So um, uh, that was all for me, but I'll just say that in this task force, uh, we hope to... Um, uh, or we're planning to have a call for a special issue on the political implications, uh, political ambitions and implications of resilience, and you're all invited to, 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 to submit um, abstracts to it. It will come out uh, early next year. Thank you. concept is a sort of putative scientific concept. But it looks very likely that the scientists involved are going to reject it as a concept, the geologists and strictly because it's almost certain that it's going to be rejected. Does it matter that it has the scientific imprimatur or not as a concept of the social sciences? 
Can you just say one more question? Um, Okay, um, my name is Jose Manuel Quintana Diaz. I'm based in Frankfurt, Goethe University, and I misspoke in the last, um, last talk well, that it's a huge challenge to, to, bridge the, um, to bridge the gap between social science and natural science, and it's a huge um, challenge to apply systems thinking to the social science. Um, I'm confronted by myself and my work with this. Um, and the solution which I found to this, the question which you put on the floor is at least what is satisfying my, my purpose in my work is that I um, relate my system thinking to um, the work of the autocratic autocratic <coughs> of Umberto Matubana, Francisco Villa, and it's already established in natural science. And now the question is if something what is already established in social and uh, natural science. How can you bring this um, understanding of systems to the social science? And you mentioned that your um, that your cousin mm -hmm. and one of his um, students was Nita Zuma. He actually proposed a lot of good features how to apply autocratic system thinking to social science. And it's quite hard for my work, and it makes my work really clear to distinguish what what kind of systems I'm talking about: autocratic systems, which can reproduce re re themselves. Or autopoetic systems, which get reproduced by, by an autopoetic system. And that's just a, it's a feedback. I think it's really helpful. I can't hear that, and it might be the case for your work on your assignments. Okay, thanks. Um, I just saw some hands at the beginning, but maybe while the questions are still fresh, we can invite the time to respond, and then we'll take another round of questions. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Jeremy, uh, uh, does it matter if geologists accept that of the scene as a global era or not? Actually, I don't think it does so much. Uh, in fact, I don't think this has been, this is not the concept driven by geologists at all. Uh, and the fact that they take the thing seriously is, is quite popular. <laughs> uh, um, it's a concept that, that very much, uh, according to my interpretation, was drawn. Uh, that's where it, it, it has its primary focus. And I think uh, even though geologists are still debating whether we have met the Holocene and uh, the Anthropocene, uh, the, the Global Environment Change Scholarship has suddenly already accepted it uh, as, a, as an important figure for what uh, that sort of summarizes a long tradition of scholarship and findings, and verbal findings. Uh, uh, of human uh, alterations in natural systems. Uh, so I think it has already done a lot of work in that scholarship, irregardless of what the geologists tell us. Uh, and uh, what I tried to demonstrate earlier was how this concept now is also traveling into new domains. And I think uh, certainly uh, the political ecologists or the, the environment, uh, humanities people will, will not be guided by the geologist's uh, acceptance of the modern concept. Of course, of course, it may offer some, give some additional authority to the concept if, if, uh, if the geologist is But I don't think that's, that doesn't explain the potency of, of the concept as such. But certainly, it, it seems to be speaking to something, uh, a sentiment and a, a, a research agenda that, that, that appeals to. to, to uh, Going to different scholarly communities. I think that the question that I would like to explore that is also to what extent will this concept make its way into the policy debate? Right now, it's still very much an academic concept that is played around with by different academic uh, 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 communities. But will it actually, and perhaps very different from the which is very much a policy concept now, uh, I'm not so sure whether that will actually work. Okay, uh, just one word about that. Um, Crutzen was an atmospheric chemist, so it wasn't, the, the geology didn't coin the term. They were sort of very reluctantly sort of, do we, do we want this? And I think maybe maybe uh, about a million years in the future they might accept it. Because then you can see it in the, in the strategic 
Uh, about the orthopedic system, we, um, uh, in the paper that I referred to, we had a section about the, the most important system theory in social science, which is um, and, and I think we, we, we conclude that it is not compatible with coupled social ecological systems, because in his view, the environment and what's inside and outside the system can speak to each other. And, and, and if you try to, to apply that, his idea of, of the autocreative system to um, uh, society and nature, it, it suddenly you have one system that contains everything. So, so we don't think it's very useful. But we think that the, uh, for us, or for me at least, it would be much, much better to talk about natural systems and social processes. To avoid having a, this kind of scientific imperialism that you take one ontology and put over everything. So if you talk about social processes, we can involve all kinds of institutional theories and so forth. And we have natural systems and social processes. They interact, and ontologically, they are at the same level. There's not some one trumping, trumping the other. That's my solution. Just a quick feedback. No one completely, uh, thank you. Uh, no one completely got rid of the uh, ontological um, theory. And the departure from the ontological theory to try to grasp reality by ontology to the ontogenesis. So I think um, it would be really, really, uh, yeah. good. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's not the right situation to discuss about Luhmann. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but just as a feedback, I think um, it, it can be really useful and it's actually a, a living example of the applied of the system. I, 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 I don't really understand what it means. I think I share that with, with the man. He's not the most uh, clear thinker. And I think that the Luhmann system doesn't capture it. I don't think it's the but, but if, if it works for you, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should, we should continue this wonderful discussion outside. Let's get some other people to join us. That's great. Nicholas Blumen is one of our um, most recognized sociological speakers. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, James, do you want to add anything to this, or should I take another round of questions? I'll take a round of questions. I have anecdotal things on Blumen, but I, I, I'll share them in the coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, some more questions or comments? Thank you very much, Laura and Rick, from the I was wondering whether the panel uh, could reflect from their different perspectives on what they see as the relationships between the concepts of resilience and the Anthropocene, whether from a genealogical perspective uh, or uh, Contemporary policy uptake perspective. Um, all those things are strange. Good. Okay. Thank you. I think there's one more question. Thank you. Uh, Ina Wala from Brooklyn University. I was wondering if the panelists had any reflection on the agency of individuals in pushing for these. Because as far as I know, or as far as I see, uh, the Anthropocene was kind of coined by Paul Crutzen, who also looked with, with the book on the social relation management and geoengineering, and uh, the other thoughts of like, yeah, the authority of certain individuals who propose these concepts, and whether that is a, yeah, an important variable in making something fly or not. Okay, thank you. So, who wants to this? Um, I think there is a very, very nice fit between an ideal anthropocene and, and resilience. Um, re resilience is often talked about in the context of coupled social and ecological systems. Um, and um, anthropocene, I mean, the implication of anthropocene is that you can't separate nature and society. So that I think it's a, it's a perfect concept. Anthropocene is a perfect concept uh, to apply resilience in the arm. That's, so it's almost as, as a good fit uh, between Hayek's philosophy and politics. Anthropocene, I, I, I think that's a good fit. Of course, they can do some network analysis of its quality communities as well. Uh, uh, 
and uh, so far I haven't seen that that paper of Patrick's coming. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be interesting to see how, how people overlap in these communities, and I think to some extent they do. Uh, but I think there is also some uh, divergence between the system science community. If, if we take that position of advocacy, that they are alone in it, uh, I'm suggesting now that they don't, they're not in control of the concept anymore. Uh, but that, that, that's where it, it originates. Um, and I think they have a macro uh, take on, on the system thinking, whereas uh, the resilience people have tended to explore. Uh, socio-ecological systems on a low scale, or micro kinds of of well, where they started at least. Then, but then probably expanding, I think. Yes. Where they saw the success in the small scale. So uh, uh, but certainly it's, I mean some of the key figures in the resilience today are now also promoting that receiving concept. You are not certainly one of those people. Um, and to what extent people like you on Instagram or for Curtin, uh, are important. Yes, I think certainly they are important as as spokespersons for for a concept. But but I think also I would uh, that they are not in control of the concept. I mean, if the concept really has potency, it will fly and it will travel, it will circulate, and it will become new meanings. And I think both these concepts suggest that uh, they have been successful just because they have been able to 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 to. Uh, travel from their original sort of uh, location and uh, attract sort of uh, creative minds elsewhere. So I think... Uh, um, so yes, could I add something to that agency discussion? Um, uh, yeah, I agree with what's been said. I, I think that individuals or small groups play a critical role in launching uh, uh, New concept, novel concepts, from if particularly if they're in a position they either have a substantial reputation or they're in an institutional position that allows them to do that. Um, if you think of some of the historic concepts, sustainable development, for instance, the the word sustainable development ha was already in circulation, but the position of the Brooklyn Commission allowed it, gave it a perfect platform to launch that this concept. I mean, it was launched at the summit, if you like, and then percolated uh, uh, downwards. And one, and there is scholarly work that actually looks at the individuals in the secretariat and the particular commissioners who actually worked on that concept and argued it back and forth and how to frame it so it would catch on. But then, besides that individual con contribution, it's the institutionalization quickly into the UN process and then the preparations for the Rio Earth Summit that allow that concept then to kind of reverberate uh, outwards. And biodiversity is a similar example where literally we know the meeting at which a small number, a dozen conservation biologists sat around the table and worked out what biodiversity would be. Um, and then quite rapidly it spread through the community of conservation biologists and then got hooks further out and then became institutionalized in the biodiversity treaty just like five years later. So I think it's both individual agencies is, is critical, but then institutionalization. Um, and that's where um, I share Eva's thing about the Anthropocene. Where, where will it be institutionally? Anchor. What does it mean for a government to say, well, now we're in the Anthropocene, we'll be, we'll be changing our policy on, I don't know. So, <laughs> we, 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 you know, we'll see. Um, it's unfolded before us. Um, well, it's five o'clock. I don't know if we should wrap up the session now. I think so, James. Would you like to say anything before we lose? I thought the last comments on comparing the two concepts are interesting. We have task force on different concepts, but now we're probably thinking about comparing the two the, between the task forces. It's another step we have to do because we have to do James. So any last comments before we do? Maybe we can have just comments from each of you and then end. I'm just looking forward to the coming work. Mom,
last point, which I probably have forgot to mention. The reason why I am concerned about this is not the scientific use of it, but it's the risk that it gives scientific justification for particular political initiatives. Because science is important in policy and scientific facts, and if there is a scientific uh, strong scientific underpinning of something, then it's easier for that's the word against that. Okay. So I just like to ask add one last thing. Thank everybody for coming and saying if you enjoyed this sort of interrogation of these concepts. Uh, to participate in some of our uh, working group. And if there are other ideas that we should be dealing with but we're not be dealing with, then, you know, develop a network of colleagues and, uh, you know, focus our attention on it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone, for attending. Um, the information on the task forces is on the ESG website. If you haven't accepted it yet, yeah, please feel free to do so and sign up to one of the task forces. Thank you very much for coming. Just a reminder for everybody who's um, interested that